When I was in grammar school and started getting bullied, I went to my teachers for guidance, which they gave me in the form of the question, what would Jesus do? A far more helpful, though somewhat inappropriate, question to ask myself would have been, what would Hannah Dustin do? The answer to that is, kill them all. In 1697, Hannah Dustin, a white woman from Haverhill, Massachusetts, massacred a Native American family of ten, leaving only two survivors, a young boy and a woman they wounded but could not prevent from escaping. She then stole their canoe to escape, scalped their corpses, and then collected a substantial bounty for her deeds. Given the historical relationship between European civilization and Native American tribes, which basically boils down to an apocalyptic century spanning genocide, Dustin's actions are particularly deplorable. It might be useful to add that six of the ten Abenaki tribes people Dustin murdered were children. At this point, you probably think Dustin is about a step below Andrew Jackson on the American legacy scale of one to burning in hell. Now, I'm going to complicate things. The Abenaki kind of sort of did it to her first. Let me explain. Hannah Dustin, 40-year-old mother to 11 children, had just given birth to her 12th baby when the Abenaki attacked her village, stole all of her things, and burned her house to the ground. As this wasn't enough of an imposition, the attacking Native Americans then forced her and her neighbor Mary Neff to march 150 miles towards present-day Concord, New Hampshire, barefoot in the winter, which, as anyone familiar with the weather conditions of New England would know, was very, very, very rude of them. To add insult to injury, before they began on this journey, they smashed her newborn baby's head against a tree. They smashed her newborn baby's head against a tree. Once again, they smashed her newborn baby's head against a tree. The Abenaki deposited Hannah, Mary, and a 14-year-old boy named Samuel Levinson, who had been kidnapped the previous year, in a wigwam that stood near present-day New Hampshire's Interstate 93 to become a slave. This didn't last long, though, because the captives banded together under Dustin's fiery wrath to murder all but two members of their intended overseers. So, yeah, Hannah Dustin is justified? Maybe? Sort of? Uh, after all, the Abenaki did kill her family and torture her home to the ground. However, that particular Abenaki family hadn't ever better before. Well, you might be thinking she had to kill family, including the children, or else an alarm might be raised, the escape attempt would be ruined, and that Abenaki would seek the same sort of revenge Dustin was able to enact on them. But if escape was her sole motivation, then why did she come back for the scalps? Hannah Dustin and her party killed the family and then escaped, but she realized that no one would believe her, so she returned to desecrate the bodies. Why would Dustin want proof if not to collect the reward she later earned? Can we excuse Dustin's actions if she was motivated by more than just the need to survive? Confused? Good. So are Nathaniel Hawthorne, Cotton Mather, John Greenleaf Whittier, Henry David Thoreau, and countless writers and historians, all of whom told and retold the Dustin story. Depending on the gender norms of the century and the personal beliefs of the writer, Hannah Dustin is either reviled as a horrifying monster, an American icon, or commercially viable subject for bobbleheads and sermons. However, each of the authors handles justifying Dustin's actions the same way omitting and adding new facts, and playing up certain angles of the story to suit the purposes of the writer and audience. Cotton Mather, who hated religious convictions of the French and Native Americans who the French had influence over, which happened to include the Abenaki, used Dustin's unwavering faith in the English version of the Lord to imply that her actions were not only right, but predestined. Nathaniel Hawthorne hated her guts, as well as Cotton Mathers, who he called an old-hearted, pedantic bigot. He then goes on to wish that Hannah Dustin's soul in the canoe had sunk, and she had drowned for her crimes. Whittler, writing of the mother's revenge, stresses that one child of the family survived, and claims Dustin allowed the child to live out of memory of her own children, which serves to counterbalance the brutal murder of the rest of the family, somehow. Henry David Thoreau was happy to just be speaking about New England. The controversy over Hannah Dustin's legacy continues to this day. In 2008, a bobblehead figurine of Hannah Dustin sparked debate, and in August 2006, Haverhill newspaper articles stressing the Abenaki point of view in the matter shows that we are still unable to come to terms with how to remember Dustin. Why is this story so complicated for us? Why does Hannah Dustin's story keep popping up at such regular intervals? Why does this captivity story, among so many others of the same time period, have such power over us? Hold on to your hats because things are about to get somewhat controversial. See, while the United States of America has never actually stopped subjugating the Native Americans, it has been concerned with the moral implications of the decimation and active discrimination of entire people since the early 19th century. The United States of America has very rarely halted its injustice and will gladly enjoy the benefits of racism. Yet it feels the need to justify its actions, usually by dehumanizing the enemy and rendering the actions of the United States necessary 
if regrettable. It is no coincidence, then, that Hannah Dustin's story is continually revived at moments of great social unrest towards the nation's relationship with Native Americans. For example, by the 1800s, the United States increasingly sought to expand its borders westwards. This was a problem because, as usual, people already lived there. The United States needed to remove the Native Americans in order to achieve their goal of continental domination. But this upset various interest groups, the national self-identity, several treaties, and presumably the Native Americans themselves. 18th century views of womanhood, which stressed the domesticity and moral superiority of women, joined hand in hand with racism towards Native peoples to reinvigorate the legend of Hannah Dustin. Writers like Woodler stressed the necessity of Dustin's actions, claiming that Dustin, as a woman, would not normally have gone out and committed a murder spree, but her need for revenge, her desire not to become a slave, and an understandable and temporary loss of sanity excused her action. Add this to the growing worship of United States colonial heritage that was celebrated in the writings of authors like Henry David Thoreau, and you've got Hannah Dustin as a role model for children, both in her historicity and compelling and justified reasons for her actions. So, in the 1800s, you have the boom in Hannah Dustin memorabilia and the creation of several monuments in her name, the first of which made her the first woman honored in North America with her own statue, which kind of goes a long way in telling you about the agenda the country was trying to promote because there must have been other remarkable women who deserved a statue who didn't neatly provide temporary relief for the we want land but we probably shouldn't kill people for it debate. Our obsession with Hannah Dustin isn't actually a an obsession with the story itself. Yes, the story is fascinating as an adventure story and a tragic version of Kill Bill gone horribly, horribly colonial. But if we were merely concerned with the actions of Hannah Dustin in their own right, then the controversy surrounding the case would be more likely to focus on people killing people in a vicious cycle of vengeance, starting with English encroachment on native lands, fed by King Philip's war, and ending with Hannah Dustin's murder of the Adam family. The fact is, we are concerned with whether or not Hannah Dustin can be called justified for her actions because she's still a more comfortable way to judge our involvement with the destruction of the Native American tribes than, I don't know, actually confronting our own complicity in what has happened and what is still happening. This might sound surprising, but Native American tribes are still around and still up Crab Creek without a paddle, socially speaking. Here are some statistics. 29.2% of American Indian and Alaskan Native families lack health insurance coverage, as opposed to the corresponding national average of 15.5%. 28.4% of American Indians and Alaskan Natives lived under the poverty line in 2010. For the nation as a whole, the corresponding rate was 15.3%. This, of course, is in addition to widespread appropriation of their culture in movies, sports team, and popular culture and music, along with standard ignorance to the current and past degradation of Native American populations. What makes this particularly striking is that all American citizens are arguably complicit in this by the simple act of existing in a country that was only made possible by the murder of entire civilizations. From the works about Hannah Dustin I have used in my research, I have learned more about the time period the pieces are from and the viewpoints and beliefs of its authors than about Dustin herself. Dustin is a safe way to examine our own behavior because it can be argued that she was justified in her actions even if those actions were wrong. It is definitely a step in the right direction to criticize and question Hannah Dustin as it means we are still concerned with the wrongs of the past and present as long as we can maintain a safe distance from them both. However, the focus and study of Hannah Dustin and history in general is useless if we are not using it to examine our own behavior now and trying to change that behavior if it is wrong.